Um, so welcome everybody to the um, March uh, SNU Supernova Seminar uh, talk. Um, and this time we have a speaker who I think needs a little introduction, um, Craig Wheeler, um, who, whose name I've, I've seen on books um, throughout my PhD. Um, and it's so good to finally see you in person um, and to have you here and talk about Beetlejuice following a extensive um, overview article uh, posted, I think, last last autumn. So Craig, please, please go ahead. OK, well, here we go. All right. Um, OK, so I, I've been doing what I've sort of called the Betelgeuse project for quite a while. I want to give a little history on how I got into it, not because it's particularly important to the science. It just amuses me how I got into it. So I'd like to relate that that story. But here, here we are. Here, here's what we see in the night sky uh, taken by a friend of mine here in, in, in Austin with the, the belt and the sword. And there's our, our target and some point about the Betelgeuse is it's near enough that you can actually resolve it and, and see what's happening on the surface. It's barely, but you can. It makes it a, a special thing. Um, so I will tell that story of what's uh, what's going on here. Um, in terms of the background, uh, and part of the reason I want to give this is to advertise these people and, and, and some others as well that, that I worked with as undergraduates uh, as we were getting into sort of some quantitative aspects of this. Uh, so Serafina Nance is now a graduate student at Berkeley. Uh, Jamie Sullivan's also a graduate student at Berkeley. Uh, Manuel Diaz uh, made a pass through uh, Penn State. I've lost track of where he is exactly right now. Uh, Maria Kulitavaki. Okay, yes. so I think the, uh, the Maria Kutulakaki is uh, Kutulaki is is in uh, Ireland studying atmospheres now. I think, and I've kind of lost track of Liju. But it was a wonderful team of undergraduates that really got me going uh, quantitatively on this. So I want to tell the backstory a little bit of. of of my obsession, which started, I don't remember exactly when, back around 2007, that I would give popular talks on supernovae around in various places. And somebody would always ask me, what happens when Betelgeuse blows up? And I would say, you know, I've been asked that question before. And uh, I really need to think about that at some time. And then I wouldn't. And the next popular talk, somebody would ask the same thing. So I, I finally uh, wrote a little did a little homework and, and wrote a, a sidebar in, in my book, Cosmic uh, Catastrophes, that came out some time ago now. Um, I just sort of a qualitative description of what I thought might happen. Uh, iron core collapse. This is Sean Couch's territory, 10 to 50 ergs of neutrinos uh, would emerge from the envelope in about an hour, 600 years later, a human body. This is where I had thought about neutrinos a little bit, would receive 100 trillion neutrinos, which is a lot less than a lethal dose of, of radiation, but we would get flooded by the neutrinos first. Uh, I, I hadn't really thought about neutrino detection at the time. So the relevance to, to, to you folks in your community, I'm going to come back to uh, uh, later. But then there would be a shock wave that would reach the surface. You get a blast of ultraviolet radiation lasting about an hour. Uh, the flux of that UV would be less than the sun gives to the Earth, but it would still be noticeable. Uh, maybe some disruption of atmospheric chemistry. Uh, light curve would be kind of like this. We expect it to be a type 2 supernova with a plateau and then fall off. So in a couple of weeks, uh, you, you'd get to something like a billion times the solar luminosity uh, in, intrinsically at Betelgeuse. And at the Earth, it'd be about as bright as a quarter moon. I don't know exactly what that is, but of that, that order. And, and, and last about three months. And then by the time the shock reaches the Earth, propagates through the interstellar medium, uh, it'd be about 100,000 years later after the explosion. And at, and at that point, I think the solar magnetosphere would detect that shock wave. So the, the bottom line coming from uh, of order 200 uh, parsecs is that uh, Betelgeuse will not do us a lot of damage, but it will be very dramatic uh, when, it, when it blows up. So then I, I, I've been teaching uh, for many years this uh, non-major undergraduate class on supernovae. Sean was a TA in it at some point. 
And I began to ask my students to keep an eye on, on Betelgeuse. And, and so I would give them, uh, when I got to this point in the lecture, all these arguments about massive stars and core collapse and type 2P supernovae and, and joke that we were so unsure about when it might explode that it might be tonight. So please go outside and look at Betelgeuse tonight and let me know if it gets brighter. So I did that shtick for a long time, maybe 20 years, and it uh, pulled it on maybe 5,000 students. And uh, so far, nobody's seen it get brighter, but it was a part of my my obsession at, at that that level. But seriously now, during that time, I got more frustrated to know that Betelgeuse is sitting there. We know it's going to blow up. It's that got a massive star, but we really don't have any idea when. Uh, even the mass was rather uncertain. Is it 15 solar masses, more, less? Uh, and, and started to ask myself, well, how would you learn more about this to try to figure out First, the question was, when is it going to explode? That was the issue I kind of came with. So that's where uh, the Betelgeuse uh, project uh, actually started. Uh, so uh, around 2011, and I've forgotten exactly when this was, uh, my, my notion was to pick up some ideas that Dave Arnett at Arizona had promulgated, and, and Sean later worked on this with Dave and, and other people, uh, that as you get into the late stages of burning, so you burn hydrogen into helium, helium and carbon oxygen, then you burn the carbon and oxygen into heavier things, silicon, finally an iron core that collapses, that, that in those late stages of shell burning, it's a very dynamic uh, uh, process that could lead to sonic waves. And some of those sonic waves might propagate out and uh, reach the surface and, and you could analyze them and, and learn things deep down in the guts of the star. That, that was the idea. <clears throat> so the, the question, I'm sorry, that keeps, uh, uh, could, could you see small perturbations on the surface of, of Betelgeuse, given that it does have this roiling, massive convective envelope around the outside? Uh, Betelgeuse is too bright for many traditional telescopes. You have to damp it down. It's a kind of a tricky thing to study. But but you might be able to model frequencies, amplitudes, things like that. And, and about this time, along came this wonderful series of papers by Paxton et al. Uh, and the Mesa Evolution Code. And about that time, I'm sort of having these thoughts of sonic waves and, and uh, ah, darn it. Every time I touch the mouse, it advances. I stop it. Uh, so the code became available. And then just by accident, I had a bunch of students, undergraduate students, come and say, well, could I do something with you? And so we uh, we picked Betelgeuse as, as a project, those young people I introduced you to. <clears throat> so we studied a range of masses with, with Mesa, <clears throat> some rotating, some non-rotating. Uh, we included some magnetic effects. Uh, we, we picked up the parameters of Betelgeuse as, as had been compiled recently at the time, its luminosity, its radius, temperature, and, and the distance. And I, I bolded that. I'm not sure you can quite see. But uh, 200 parsecs plus or minus nearly 50. And that turned out to be a hanger because that's a very large uncertainty in the distance and, and then you square that to figure out what the, the uncertainties are in the luminosity. And, and they're rather large if you're trying to make a quantitative model. So we, we, we worried about these uh, uh, statistical uncertainties. We looked at one sigma error bars, which is what that kind of is, and, and three sigma error bars. With three sigma error bars, you can drive a truck through it. Um, although the, the, the error bars are likely asymmetric and more complicated thing, but we wanted to get some handle on, on what the uncertainties of these various things are. So we did this array of models and uh, uh, looked at the uh, hersprung russell diagram. And, and Betelgeuse is up about here. It's a red supergiant. But with these uncertainties and in, in distance propagated into other things, uh, it, it could be sort of anywhere in this area. And if you consider these three sigma error bars, it could be from here down to here, just this huge range of uncertainty, particularly in, in, in luminosity. And, and that makes all the difference in the world in terms of what mass you're talking about and, and what evolutionary state 
it, it's in. So those uncertainties were, were really quite uh, important to think about. Uh, statistically, uh, Betelgeuse is most likely to be in core helium burning because that lasts about 100,000 years. Uh, carbon burning or, uh, and beyond, which might last a couple of thousand years, uh, is just unlikely. But of course, uh, statistics don't bear a whole lot when you're talking about a single object, but ju just for perspective. And, and I think the, the notion that we're 100,000 years from explosion is still uh, the, the proper perspective. <clears throat> So we did the, the rotating models and non-rotating models, and, and the rotation was pretty straightforward at some level. You sit on the main sequence for a while, uh, you're, you're rotating at some constant rate, you can pick a fairly high value. Then at the end of uh, core hydrogen burning, the whole star shrinks briefly, and, and you spin up, and then you ignite a shell and beyond that, the inner core shrinks and the outer envelope expands to become the red supergiant that we see in the sky nowadays. But as that expansion occurs, then, then the rotation velocity plummets. And, and so it, it promptly, over rather fast time, hundreds of years, thousand years, plummets down to a very low velocity. So, so you can't see my arrow off the side here. But but the uh, rotation of velocity that, that that was reported at the time, uh, corrected for uh, the the angle of aspect angle of looking at it, is about fifteen kilometers a second. So that's what that arrow represents. So you, you get this star plummeting down as it's expanding and slowing down. It passes through the observed value of about fifteen kilometers a second. Um, very quickly. So it's statistically unlikely to catch it in that phase. And then it keeps plummeting on down because the star is busy expanding up the red supergiant branch. So there's uh, what we discovered in this, in this process, just playing around with the Mesa model, is that uh, rotating stars give this 15 kilometer seconds only in a very brief phase near the base of the red supergiant branch before it goes up into its nominal uh, status. Uh, you could fit things by pushing error bars around, but uh, basically at the, the tip of the red supergiant branch, where we kind of think Betelgeuse is, uh, the, the, the rotation of velocity was something like uh, a tenth of a kilometer a second. So it, it's off from the observation by a factor of 150. It was not a subtle effect that, that if, if you just take a massive star and spin it up, and let it go, you do not get 15 kilometers a second. And uh, Manos Hatsopoulos, uh, my ex-student, got uh, interested in this problem and did sort of more or less the same thing, somewhat more elaborate than we did. And uh, Meredith Joyce came along with a team of people and also did the same thing, came to the same conclusion that if you just take a single star, uh, you're not gonna get anywhere near the, uh, the velocity. So there's a, a dilemma. So in this, uh, we first looked at it, uh, thought about things that might be going wrong, that maybe we uh, didn't treat the physics properly, angular momentum redistribution, and that didn't seem actually very plausible that you could change things. Uh, maybe the observed velocity is incorrect. Uh, velocity comes by, for instance, uh, putting the slate, slit of the Hubble Space Telescope across the resolved image of Betelgeuse and seeing that part of it seems to be moving away from you, part of it moving towards you. So you get an idea of this rotational velocity, uh, but that's barely resolved and the surface is roiling and convective. Uh, so there's been suspicion all along that maybe that number isn't correct. And I'll come back to that, that later, but it's, it's been done uh, since then with Alma. It's, uh, being redone by Andrea Dupree, I think maybe next week. I mean, he's got time on Hubble. So this is kind of timely. And I've been wondering whether uh, James Webb would bring something to it, but I haven't uh, found anybody using Webb to try to look at Betelgeuse. Uh, there may be technical issues there, I don't know. Anyway, that, so it, it might be the velocity is wrong, but if it's rotating, then, then we've got this factor of 150 to, to try to resolve. So, about this time, also, it was becoming clear <clears throat> that, that the majority of massive stars, O and B stars, are born in binaries. And, and there are studies claiming 
that that of order 20 percent of apparently single stars as betelgeuse is uh have in fact had a past merger so we started thinking about whether a merger might be uh, a way of re resolving or generating this this fast rotation which otherwise would would be hard to understand so the hypothesis now or the question to be addressed is is it could be that betelgeuse was once in a binary system and that a merger added angular momentum to it. So suppose it, it, it observed what, what mass we asked ourselves uh, would you have to have of a companion to merge with Betelgeuse to spin it up to 15 kilometers a second. And if you just do simple conservation of angular momentum and, and ask about a, a, a companion at sort of the radius, the, the orbital radius that, that Betelgeuse has now, uh, it's about a solar mass. Now, it turns out that's not a unique number, but it's representative. And, and you could then uh, uh, spin Betelgeuse up and get that number. Uh, it, it turns out that if you think about this, you're trying... Oh, man. Huh. Uh, you're you're uh, merging these two stars. You're going to eject some mass... Uh, that that mass could propagate out through the circumstellar medium at about 10 kilometers a second. Uh, if, and that goes for like 100,000 years or so uh, that you might get a shell at, at uh, about a parsec out. So if you look at uh, Betelgeuse at, at, uh, of order 200 parsecs, uh, there's, a, there's a better number these days, uh, 165 that I'll get to in a bit, uh, that about... Uh, of order 15 or 20 arc seconds or arc minutes away, you, you should see some effect of this mass that's been uh, ejected blowing out of the interstellar medium. And, and at the time, I didn't know this, but people had already studied this issue. And uh, Desen et al. Uh, with Herschel had, had formed this uh, wonderful image where there are stuff going on at order arc, arc minutes. And it uh, there may be other explanations for it, but it's not inconsistent with Betelgeuse having blown off a shell during its merger uh, 100,000 years or so ago. So the alive, uh, the, the, the idea is still kind of alive. So then we, we looked at the uh, astero seismology, this idea I'd had of maybe you can peer down inside the star. So you, you could, in principle, look at the G mode, P mode, gravity mode, pressure mode, oscillations of it. Uh, we did a more brute force thing of just say, well, suppose there are these convective regions down on the inside in the shell burning regions, pounding on the inside of the star and sending sonic waves out. Uh, can you make an estimate about how much luminosity might deliver to the surface? What would the characteristics of those waves be? And, and we did a, a rather crude analysis following a wonderful paper by Chiodi and Quattert talking about this issue of, of making these sonic waves and whether they would propagate. Uh, you, you can estimate a characteristic frequency, just order of magnitude, the convective velocity divided by a scale height. Uh, there's a prop an envelope propagation frequency. If the waves are too slow, the envelope would absorb them and they wouldn't propagate to the surface. And, and we did a slightly more elaborate analysis that I'm going to skip over for lack of time. But you could end up estimating that the power might be delivered to the surface, and it might be about 1% of the luminosity. And in principle, that is enough, if you could see it, that, that you could detect it at you know, millimagnitude level or something. But in the, in the course of this study, and, and a more elaborate one done by uh, Jim Fuller at Caltech about the same time, you have to worry about these cutoff frequencies. You have to worry about the propagation efficiency. You have to worry about waves effervescing as they propagate. You have to worry about waves damping. There is shock dissipation. There's all sorts of effects. But the bottom line is because you have this bloated convective envelope, you probably muffle all this interconvective noise. So there's information to be had. It just doesn't get to the surface. And, and that's the, the, the current status. Although I, I wonder... Uh, all these analyses that Fuller did and that we did were all spherically symmetric, and Betelgeuse is clearly not. It's this roiling, boiling mess on the outside. So there might be some kind of 3D effects. Maybe you can percolate out through it rather than bottle it up. 
uh, haven't done anything quantitative about that, just sort of planting the seed of the idea. So then we thought more about this rotation of velocity. Um, the, the fact that Betelgeuse rotates at 15 kilometers a second, if you take the number at face value, <clears throat> is a substantial fraction of the capillarian velocity, not a lot more, not a lot less. Why is it that? So we did a, another model, and, and was, I've already skipped over one paper that I led, one paper that Serafina and Nance led, and, and this is the paper that, that James Sullivan led, uh, the third one in the series that we did. Um, it, at the outer boundary, we, we added mass to uh, Betelgeuse, and, or a star like Betelgeuse, and, and, and looked at the rotation, and particularly, we looked at the rotational induced mass loss, which which must be there if it's if it's spinning. And and so we tried to do within the context of Mason models, sort of the most sophisticated thing we could to, to kind of model in a very crude way what a merger would look like, and and studied a whole range of masses. I, I said earlier that a solar mass in principle would be enough to spin up uh, Betelgeuse. Uh, so we looked at that problem and uh, uh, some technical aspects of how much what spun up that I'm going to kind of gloss over. Uh, but but the bottom line was that for a, a range of masses and different properties that we assumed and taking into account this the annual momentum of, of merging and then ejecting uh, through this rotational induced mass loss, uh, the, the numbers always ended up excuse me, uh, of order 15 kilometers a second, a little higher, a little lower, depending on what the assumption was. But that is uh, basically what's what's going to go on. So what we did was rather simple. Uh, Manos Atsopoulos and his crew at Louisiana State have done 3D hydro models since then that get rather similar results to what our first uh, crude estimates made. So it, it looks like... Uh, the, the, the final rotation may not depend on details of the merger, but on global quantities like the initial orbital angular momentum. And that depends on how far away this putative companion was. Is it relatively nearby and you merged early on or is it a long way away and it, you had to wait until you were a full-flown uh, uh, red supergiant? Uh, cl clearly, uh, it must be sub Keplerian once the dust solves, so you, you can't go above the Keplerian value, but it turns out you can be near there plausibly for a whole range of models if you adopt this merger hypothesis. Uh, then there's a question about what, what to do with the fact that Betelgeuse is, but beside the roiling envelope, it, it pulsates with, with various pretty well-established frequencies. And in our analysis up to this point, the three papers we wrote on this, um, we, we thought about it, but hadn't done anything about it. And uh, uh, along came this wonderful paper by uh, Meredith Joyce in 2020 that I'd alluded to before. And, and she used the, uh, the, the technical pulsation analysis of the P modes and the G modes and all that kind of stuff, which I had sort of dreamed of, but hadn't done anything about. And, and analyze the, the pulsations. And I must say, I'd, I'd sort of had this idea because I realized that if you could analyze the, the pulsations, I've got a 400 day basic pulsation that that would tell you something, a new a piece of information about Betelgeuse, it would give you a new constraint on the ratio of mass to radius. And so I had this basic idea, but I didn't pursue it at all. And, and uh, Meredith came along and did this wonderful uh, uh, job of it that, that I, I was and am still very jealous of. So what, what they found out is, is the, the basic 460-day period is a breathing mode, is the fundamental mode driven by the kappa mechanism. Uh, there's a 186-day period, which they uh, resolved as being the first overtone, and people were debating is... You know, which one is the fundamental, which one's the overtone in their models, pretty well settled that. Uh, they also basically de demanded, the, whether I was arguing statistically, that the most likely thing is to be in core helium burning. They did this quantitative analysis based on the pulsations, 
and, and found that, yes, indeed, the only thing that really fit all the models that they were making and the, the data they were incorporating, uh, would say it's in core helium burning and it's 100,000 years before it explodes. Um, Joyce et all gave tighter constraints on the radius. Uh, there's a three sigma value here. Uh, before it had been 887, and uh, now it's uh, uh, 750. Tighter constraints on the mass, uh, still basically in the range 15 to 20 solar masses. And the thing that I had not anticipated coming out of this is, is they got a tighter constraint on the distance. So I complained many slides ago about the fact that there was a 20% uncertainty in the distance and that propagated through all the things you were trying to think about. Uh, they cut that uncertainty in half to 10% or, or maybe a little less. So the, so the best model now for a, or, or value for a, uh, the, the distance is 165 parsecs. And I used that in that previous estimate. It's a wonderful piece of work. Then, then along came the, the great dimming. I mean, things would have just sort of percolated along, I guess, but th this uh, this shook shook the world up, uh, not affecting as many people as the eclipse uh, in, in a few weeks here is going to do, particularly in central Texas. It's going to be a madhouse here, I think. But this got everybody looking at Betelgeuse. Even my wife went out and said, yeah, it looks dimmer than it used to be. So... Uh, Here's a, a record of, of the American uh, variable star observers uh, over going back to 1930, uh, and and uh, at, at the uh, tail end of that, in this regard anyway, uh, here, here comes the great dimming. That, that there's been this oscillation, this 400 day period, and and you can make out this first overtone, the 186 days, and all of a sudden, bloop, down it goes, and and that got a, a lot of attention around the world. Uh, here's some uh, lovely images that, that Miguel Montage took with the, uh, and this, uh, you can't quite see it in this, right? this minimum down here at the bottom, I can't point it with my the minimum down there at the bottom is uh, about December of 2020. Uh, I'm sorry, 2019, uh, just, just before COVID. Uh, so uh, Miguel had taken a, an image with the VLT. Again, you can resolve Betelgeuse. It's just barely enough, uh, close enough, you could do that. And it's it's a little lumpy, but kind of round. Uh, that's January, but about a year later, it's got this very distorted shape and, and dim on the bottom at a bright spot up there. It, it looks dramatically different. And that is clearly associated with the, uh, uh, with the great dimming. Uh, Ed Guinan at, at uh, Villanova has been observing Betelgeuse for 25 years. He's one of the experts in it, uh, commented on the light variations and how they might all come together at the same time to cause this, th this dimming. Um, uh, I don't want to re read his whole quote there, but, but looking at that 400-day period, <clears throat> he was speculating that maybe if it got a particularly big amplitude at that point uh, that, that would cause this dimming. And, and he predicted the minimum on uh, February 21st of 2020. And, and that's basically he nailed it within a few days. Uh, whether it's, it, it's uh, exactly that, I think, is still a little bit unclear, but it, it, it credit it. Uh, Levesque and Massey uh, came along and did optical spectroscopy during this time, looking at the titanium oxide bands, same technique that, that Guinan uses, uh, estimated the temperature, deduced that small changes in the effective temperature could not make the large change in the VMAG to the luminosity. Uh, so they thought that some temporary cold period on the surface of Betelgeuse uh, due to convective turnover, which was kind of what Ed was thinking about, it is not the primary cause. And, and they proposed that there was an increase in large grain gray dust that had been ejected out of Betelgeuse to cause this thing. And a Andrew Dupree has been studying uh, Betelgeuse for a long time, measured the rotation velocity, uh, started a group called the Month of Betelgeuse. It's turned out to be several years now. Um, but, but this group, uh, of whom Montarger is, is one of them, 
observed a, a, an ultraviolet flare in October of, 2000, of 2019, which was prior to the great dimming, but, but relevant to it, uh, I think people think. So here's uh, uh, an illustration of what uh, Dupree et al. measured at the time. The green line down here was prior to the, uh, the, the great dimming. And then the, the red here was uh, just before the Great Dimming, which was in December of 2020. So this is a little before that. But Betelgeuse gave a bright flare uh, in, that they saw in the ultraviolet magnesium lines. And, and then uh, by February 3, the, the Great Dimming was, was over, and they were back down to this purple stuff again. So there was a a precursor flare of some kind. So Dupree and, and crew argued that what, and sort of thinking in, in Levesque and, and Massey terms, that, that Betelgeuse had a flare of some kind, origin not particularly explained, sent off a blob of matter from the surface, and that blob of matter just happened to get in the way of the, the viewing angle to Earth, and, and caused an obscuration. And so that, that, that is their hypothesis. It remains one of the active hypotheses of, of what, what went on. There, there are people, and I will say Ed Guinan is, is still one of them, I think, that are skeptical of, of this scenario and, and wonder if Betelgeuse looks like this, that it did have large, really massive star spots on the surface by which the, uh, the the net luminosity would go down because of that star spot. Now that's what Levesque and Massey are specifically arguing did not happen. And they're still saying, I'm not so sure. Uh, again, it's a question of, of how much changes in the effective temperature could account for the visual luminosity. And one of the questions that emerged in my mind after all this is still there is, if if Betelgeuse looks something like that, how do we even determine an effective temperature? An effective temperature is supposed to be a thing averaged over the whole surface of the star. And if the surface of the star is, is this much disrupted, I'm not sure, you, well, you can define an effective temperature at some level, but how reliable it is and what you can use to measure things, I think needs to be thought about seriously. And, and this this is still... Uh, in, in the conversation is a, a viable possibility. So what does T effective mean is one of the questions that still emerges in my mind. Now I want to look at uh, sort of recent developments to catch me up to phase and catch you folks up to phase. Um, uh, Manos uh, Hatsopoulos and I wrote a, a review paper uh, published in, in the UK and, and that's part of why I got this invitation, I think, perhaps, in that community. Uh, and, and we reviewed sort of all of this and, and some of the things that I'm going to tell now in the, in the, in the last few slide, slides of the talk. Um, still coming back to the point, and maybe I didn't make this at the time, so it's time to catch up with it again. Um, the oscillation period gave Meredith Joyce new information, constraints on mass over radius. The gravity is also a measure of mass over radius. And if we can measure the gravity at the surface of Betelgeuse, we would have yet another piece of information to fold into the constraints. And uh, my colleague, David Lambert here at Texas uh, made some classic observations of, of the gravity. You look at uh, the strengths of uh, emission and absorption lines and, and came up with a number but over the years, uh, people have gotten quite a large range of log G, like a factor of three. And, and so that really needs a better measurement. I don't know, I'm not an expert in that kind of stellar spectroscopy, uh, but, but that still remain, was, I flagged that when we started writing papers on it. And I still think that there needs to be somehow a better measurement of, of log G. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's just sort of an, an open issue. Um, the, the asteroseismology is tough. There have been people, a uh, recent paper by uh, Yair Arkavi and a, and a student, uh, talking about doing asteroseismology of massive stars. 
and, and arguing that, that in fact, you can do it more effectively than one might think if you go about it properly. Um, uh, and, but, but they're still talking about main sequence stars. So, so I think the problem of trying to do asteroseismology for a red supergiant like Betelgeuse is, is just immensely attractive as a potential and, and hard to implement. And we talked about magnetic fields a bit, and we talked about common envelope evolution, and uh, you, you can do spectropolarimetry of Betelgeuse, which gives you another set of observations of how distorted it was during the Great Gimmick that, that I'm just not going to talk about for lack of time here. Uh, comment on, on recent observations that there's been a paper by Devron et al. Uh, in 2024 uh, using the VLT again to, to look at the irregular distribution of silicon oxide on, on the surface. And, and they end up arguing that their observations could support both a Guinan-like coal spot and a Levesque and Massey and Dupree dust cloud model. So that remains unresolved, I think, that both effects could be having some, some problem. And we really haven't settled on what caused the great dimming after all that. Uh, another paper by Jadlowski and, and crew, uh, they've been looking at Betelgeuse for a long time, 15 years of, of spectroscopy, uh, doing tomography, where you can look at lines formed in different layers of the outer atmosphere around the photosphere, but beyond it and somewhat deeper uh, with a robotic telescope in, in Tenerife. And, and seeing that the, these uh, layers on the outside, they can, can kind of divide into five of them, and, and they end up moving at, at different, they, they don't all expand and contract at the same time. Some of them are going up when some of them are going down, and it's a, a complicated environment there, particularly during the great dimming and, and, and afterwards. The different layers can be out of phase, and, and so that uh, that would confuse the asteroseismology, uh, but, it, but it's a an aspect of the true nature of Betelgeuse one, one needs to, to think about. Uh, the luminosity after the Great Dimming, which was here in December of 2001, is, is restoring. So it's, it came out of the Great Dimming and, and it's gone into then kind of did it in and it's been doing, doing this. So it turns out, uh, and, you, and you can see this just by, by eye, that the uh, frequency doubled of, of the main breathing oscillation of Betelgeuse. It was about 400 days. It's now about 200 days. So it may have shifted from its fundamental breathing mode into this first overtone. And so, so people are, are thinking about that. I'm not sure what the quantitative state of that is. Um, I, I did want to bring you kind of up to date, and I apologize that this particular plot is so old. It, I got it three days ago from Andrea Dupree. And so showing basically the, the great dimming, uh, this recovery I just showed you. And then some of these people who have been monitoring just said, you know, I'm not sure it's not going to go into another dimming again. And I personally don't know what's happening, but the, the fact is that here toward the tail end, and, and this point is three or four days ago, uh, it has turned around and going you know, after this rising phase, after the great dimming, it does seem to be going down again, at least temporarily. This may just be an annealing of this out of phase, complicated oscillation triggered by the great dimming. Uh, but there you go. So people are, are clearly keeping an eye on this and, and that story will continue to, to rotate. Um, so it is, is Betelgeuse rotating rapidly or not? So one of the things that's caused a bit of a recent fuss was a paper that, that just came out from uh, Ma and, and Selma Demink and, and their crew uh, asking this question of, do we is, is Betelgeuse really rotating? Or, or going back to the issue of whether that could be misinterpreted in some way. And again, there've been people wondering whether it was misinterpreted all along. So they did an elaborate simulation of Betelgeuse, and they are arguing that the apparent rotation could be due to a, the way in which the convective cells on Betelgeuse are, are averaged in the ALMA data, not particularly addressing the Dupree's original Hubble data and new data she might just get. 
And, and their claim is you can, just by the random flowing of this outer convective envelope, you, you can, and then averaging the way the observations are made, that you can get phases when it looks like there's a blue shift in one hemisphere and a red shift in the other hemisphere, which one could interpret as a rotation, but in, in their models, erroneously so. It, it is just, it's a stochastic boiling that can give you the effect of rotation. Um, they were nice enough to send me this paper for comments. I, I read it at some level and, and uh, sent them back some, some comments about it. Uh, I haven't really fully understood what they're saying or how they're saying it. They seem to say that this apparent rotation is a rather common phenomenon. And that seems very counterintuitive to me if you really have this stochastic envelope. Um, so I'll just leave it there. But I, I have not absorbed it enough to truly understand uh, what the basis of their claims are. Uh, but this question has been there all along. Are we really interpreting the data correctly of, of whether uh, Betel just rotating? If it's not rotating, then the whole merger hypothesis goes out the window. So th there's a lot right on this in that sense. Uh, the one thing I, I'm sure of is that this hypothesis that Betelgeuse is not rotating rapidly uh, by this mechanism uh, needs testing, uh, that, that this still has to be a stochastic thing. So you could get a, an apparent rotation, but the axis of rotation should shift stochastically with time, as far as I can tell. And, and so it's, it's up to the observers to make the repeated observations, which are not trivial, and, and show that the axis is still basically the same thing. And, and I think that is uh, not mind reading her, but I think that is Andrew Dupree's point that she measured with Hubble a couple of times, almost done it, that it's all been consistent with the rotation on the same axis, I think. But but how absolutely rigorous that statement is, I don't know. We should keep an eye on that. Uh, here, here's a one really out of the corner that I had ignored, and, and, and we talked about it in our, our review that Ralph Neuheiser has looked at the historical analysis of Betelgeuse and, and makes, if you set all the rest of this aside, he makes a fairly coherent argument that uh, Betelgeuse was yellow 2,000 years ago, not red. And you could understand that in principle if Betelgeuse had, had gone through its minimum just before it climbs up the red supergiant branch that's where it would naturally be that very brief phase as, as the rotation velocity plummets down. Uh, it, you might catch it in the yellow phase where it was indeed rotating about 15 kilometers a second as a single star. So it, it is not completely out of the question. Again, it would, if, if this was true, that that's what you're seeing, that yes, there is a rotational velocity, but it's just this accidental rapid phase you pass through again you wouldn't need a, a, a merger uh it would say that uh betelgeuse is in early core helium burning and joyce at all are saying no that's probably not completely likely either so I, this is just a thing to have in the back of your mind if you want to think about this of, of whether betelgeuse has actually changed its its aspect uh, on on historical time scales uh, here's a big issue that that been here kind of all along, and I still don't know the resolution of it. Uh, question of why supernova 1987A had a progenitor that was a blue supergiant when Betelgeuse is red. That is, if you want to hypothesize that Betelgeuse has undergone a merger, it's a very different outcome than apparently the progenitor of 87A. So the, the merger of 87A isn't proven, but it's reasonably well accepted and established. So I'd be careful about how strong one makes these statements. Um, but uh, people have, have, have looked at merger models of 87A. Betelgeuse is still a red supergiant. Uh, what what uh, Podzielowski, Menon, and Hager have, have, have looked at is if in the process of merging, you stir helium from the core out into the helium envelope, uh, in the hydrogen envelope, that will tend to make it contract down and, and become a, a blue supergiant. So th there are rational reasons for seeing that the progenitor should be blue. Well, Betelgeuse is, is not 
blue, it's it's red. So it somehow must have avoided this helium dredge up, uh, a so-called quiet merger, uh, as even Ovin Posiglowski measured it. So the, the question has been for some time and still remains, what determines the difference? Um, for some reason, apparently in a merger of Betelgeuse, uh, it didn't mix helium outward when 87A did. Uh, so there's work work to be done on convolope evolution and, and mergers, and then there's work ongoing on that. It's a tough problem. Mergers are a complex, multidimensional, multi-parameter problem. There's a recent uh, 2024 paper by the Louisiana State crew uh, doing more elaborate 3D hydro simulations of the merger. Very interesting paper. Uh, there's a paper that is not specifically on Betelgeuse by Schneider and, and Podsiedlowski and, and collaborators, uh, looking at uh, doing a whole bunch of models and looking at which ones lead to blue supergiant progenitors and which ones lead to red supergiant progenitors. And if you go in and look at the ones that end up red, they are consistent with a moderate ZAMS mass of order 15 solar masses and an accretion of a substantial amount of mass. So you, you can find within the parameter space things that look like 87A and things that look like uh, Betelgeuse, but it doesn't tell you exactly what was the internal physics of the merger that caused this uh, Betelgeuse to take this particular path and, and 87A to take that particular path. Uh, but but their calculations are are certainly relevant. I, I I will note that they did not uh they they used Mesa they did not put in rotation induced mass loss and I think they have to if they're going to explore the rotation uh then you're going to have the mass loss associated with that so that may just be a quantitative issue uh but it's one I'll flag as something that needs to be done a little more can be done a bit more accurately it should be. And then there's a recent paper by Chen and Ivanova. Ivanova has been one of the experts looking at the common envelope evolution for a long time, uh, not looking at Betelgeuse specifically, um, but looking at connections between so-called red luminous, no, luminous red novae and common envelope evolution and exploring particularly carefully uh, an issue that Ivanova has fretted about for a long time uh, of the importance of recombination energy and radiation pressure on mass loss uh, after uh, during common envelope evolution and afterwards. So again, this paper was not specifically about Betelgeuse, but it's definitely very relevant to properly treating the physics of a merger of, 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 of any kind of star, but a Betelgeuse-like system. Uh, question of what is this uh, current evolutionary state of Betelgeuse? Uh, Meredith Joyce had said it's got to be in core helium burning. There was an interesting paper by uh, Hideyuki Sayo and collaborators uh, six months ago now, uh, arguing that that uh, Betelgeuse might be quite a bit further along in its uh, oscillations. Uh, Hideyuki was a postdoc of mine years ago, very very sharp guy, working with some of the Geneva people, you know, good folks. Um, but they're arguing that, that Betelgeuse could be in central carbon burning and only a, a thousand years or so before uh, collapse. Uh, what, what they assumed was that all the signals of the oscillations were pressure modes rather than gravity modes. And, and there's a, I, I hadn't mentioned this at the time, but there's what's called a long secondary period in Betelgeuse of about 2,200 days. They're arguing that that is the fundamental P mode. And then from that, they concluded that uh, Betelgeuse is so far along that it must be in, in core carbon burning. Uh, there's been rejoinders to that. There was a paper by Molnar, uh, Meredith Joyce, and, and Leung uh, ar arguing, sorry, that um, SIO required a much larger uh, radius of Betelgeuse, of order 1,400 uh, solar radii, is about a factor of three bigger than the otherwise classical measured value. So they're arguing that that SIO is, is misinterpreting some of the the, the data. And I think that's not quite resolved. This is a uh, an ongoing thing. Uh, I have had a private communication from Andrew Dupree who, who, who agrees that SIO is, is not interpreting the ob observations or, or fitting the observations properly. But I, I think that's not completely resolved. So one should flag the idea that 
maybe we don't know <laughs> the uh, word. I, I don't think it's going to blow up tomorrow. I, I really think it's not going to blow up for 100,000 years, but this was a, a, an interesting little uh, dust up that's still not quite resolved. Um, so let me let me come back to your community, which I'm embarrassed to say I, I had not really, having even thought about what neutrinos might do to you know, induce biological problems in human bodies at some time, I hadn't really thought about what it would do to neutrino detectors. So let me throw in this one slide at the tail end, which is a, a definite uh, honored nod to your community. Um, what we will see first if Betelgeuse blows up are, are the neutrinos. And, and so what I did, this is all I managed to do as I was preparing this talk, is, is look at the distance to 87A and the distance to uh, Betelgeuse and, and square that. And then you can convince yourself that, that Betelgeuse should put out a neutrino signal of order 100,000 times that of 87A. So you folks are going to see something like 2 million neutrinos when it goes off. Now, I think it's not going to go off for 100,000 years, and your technology will be different by then. We may be flying detectors out and orbiting them around Betelgeuse by the time it finally blows up. But uh, if, if indeed I'm, I'm completely wrong and Betelgeuse blows up over Paris tomorrow, so here's Orion and, and there's Betelgeuse blowing up, uh, you're going to get a heck of a signal. Uh, so you're be prepared, going to burn out all of your uh, bats of water and stuff. Okay, well, let me uh, end up with conclusions here. Uh, Betelgeuse is still an amazing thing. You can go out and look at it at night. I do that regularly and convince myself it hadn't blown up yet. Uh, still a, a remarkable object of study and, and will be for a long time, I think. Uh, here's, here's some conclusions to take away. Uh, it, it does seem to be rotating too fast by a factor of 150. I've given the caveats about that. Maybe we're misinterpreting something. Uh, unless it was yellow 2,000 years ago, unless the Doppler motions are being misinterpreted. Um, if it is rotating as fast as it apparently is, uh, then that extra angular momentum may very plausibly have come from a merger. Uh, we expect stars of that mass to be in binary systems and, and to merge. Again, that's a, a statistical argument, and we're talking about a single object. So you can't necessarily apply statistics in the same way. Uh, the pulsation period constrains the radius and the distance and the evolutionary state. Uh, the great dimming did not portend an imminent explosion. It, there's something very interesting going on that we haven't completely resolved yet, uh, but pre-explosion is not one of them, I don't think. Uh, the origin might have been related of the great dimming related to a, a resonance of pulsation periods, as Ed Guinan first discussed, or the expulsion of a nice cloud or extra large star spots, I, I think that's still uh, a work in progress to decide exactly what caused the great dimming. If we get another one shortly, then we'll we'll have a look at that. Uh, I think after all this, the uh, the merger hypothesis survives. It needs a lot more work. It's a very complicated 3D problem. So that's where we stand. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, you just had to go, uh, so I'll take over. Um, okay. we are at the top of the hour, but I think we have time for, for several questions if people have them. Well, I, I stalled around and, uh, <clears throat> delayed us with my fumbling with the PowerPoint. I apologize. That's okay. Um, Alec? Yeah, uh, per perhaps a, a naive question, but, you know, Betelgeuse is right next door and we're really good at measuring parallax these days. Uh, is it just that it's not a point object that makes that hard or what? For distance, so oh, it, it it's uh, I, I have to call you on that statement. Yes, we can measure parallaxes fairly well. You you can't you can't measure parallaxes with Hipparchus mm -hmm. on Betelgeuse because it's too bright. Ah, okay. Now you take Hipparchus out of the game, and you're left with other techniques that that are still leaving you with this ten or twenty percent uncertainty in the distance. Right. Okay. Because then you got to go back to the surface and yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Not okay. a nice question at all. No. Okay. Great. Thanks. Other questions? I got one. Please. Um, great talk, Craig. Um, as always, is it possible that um, Betelgeuse has an unseen companion that might be a neutron star or a black hole? 
And at some point, this originally more massive star gave some mass to Betelgeuse, spinning up the outer envelope, then exploded as a supernova, and we don't see it anymore. I, I think the answer to that probably must be yes, that's worth thinking about. <clears throat> and, and I haven't. I, I got off onto this common envelope merger kind of thing where you swallow a star. Yeah, no, interesting point. So I, I'm picturing swallowing the star and that overlaying momentum goes into Betelgeuse and spins it up. So you're saying, could I, could I spin it up just by the mass transfer from this companion? And then it blows up and off goes the neutron star. And then there should be a nearby pulsar. And I don't know that there is. I don't, I don't know how, sorry, or a black hole. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's less likely. I don't think we see a neutron star. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing. So, I think we would probably see the neutron star. But but I I, I you, you caught me out, Sean. I got to confess, I hadn't thought about that particular scenario in that particular context. I've thought about it, of course, in other other contexts. Yeah, but as long as we're surveying parameter space, uh, yeah. then there is a there is a conceptual parameter space there that should be thought of. Yeah, I think you just made the. It's a well-made point that it's hard to retain a red supergiant envelope in a merger, right? Blue supergiants, sure, like, uh, you know, but how do you maintain Betelgeuse being a red supergiant through the process of a merger? It's well, small but, parameter space, right? yeah, no, I, I understand, but, but there, it's a, it's small, but it's finite. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this, and, this, uh, yeah, recent paper by Schneider and Posilowski Again, it has limitations, but yeah. it, it it points in that direction. That so so the, the the question, and so I don't want to prolong this, but the question is to do these detailed things like Monos and other people are doing of trying to follow the the actual evolution of these massive stars and understand what the swallowing of the star, the plume that comes off the swallowed companion, does that penetrate the helium core? How much is is stirred out all that you need to understand to, to really resolve here are the condition because it might just be that if you if you merge when the two stars are modestly close together uh you you, you don't get the the mixing and if you merge when they're further apart there's more angular momentum and it changes the systematics and you do get a merger and a and a, and a blue supergiant yeah. but, but i think we're a long way from understanding that it's a critical problem in this area to understand in, in detail with all the parameter space to be explored how 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 big is the uh, parameter space to end up red yeah and uh if i if i could be indulged this might be a question from the broader audience actually that's Please. here on the call um how it, it let's say hyper k um would we be able to detect the nuclear fusion neutrinos from Betelgeuse with a large, a larger detector? Oh, thank you. I, I, I actually put that line somewhere in the slides and glossed over it. But, but yes, that, so there, there will be low energy thermal neutrinos generated during the shell burning. Mm -hmm. and if you set aside the ordinary asteroseismology, detecting those neutrinos would be the best way to really right now peering inside and i'm sorry i kind of lost that in the shuffle because i had yeah. had that thought but i'll give you credit for it you're the one that raised no. it no no I oh so I, yeah There's hyper k can you can you measure kev neutrinos coming from betelgeuse uh before is one of the things that snooze will be able to do is at least during the the uh, silicon burning phase when it's when the the core temperature is very high yeah. The thermal neutrinos are high enough energy that uh, uh, existing detectors, as well as future detectors, will be able to see it for days to weeks before the explosion. Cool. Uh, steady cool. state before it gets so extreme as silicon burning is still very hard, I think. Okay. okay. Cool. I didn't know that, though, Alex. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think I just saw a paper not that long ago from Hatton um, that kind of talks about this a little bit. Okay. 
Cool. No, that's a very exciting possibility that, that we have that. So I, I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm putting money on the table to say this isn't going to happen for 100,000 years so that you won't see that silicon burning now. But, you know, talk's cheap. Yep. Guys have worked very hard to, to build these instruments. That's a very exciting possibility to, to put a limit on, on what those uh, silicon burning neutrinos would be. So are you going to put that in your review, Sean? I hope. Sure, absolutely. All yeah. right. Look forward to it. I was going to say earlier, I, I borrow your shtick about going out and looking up at Betelgeuse. When Did I, you? When Did I you? peek under well, that. Imitation yeah. is the sincerest form of flattery, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That seems like a good end point for, for this. So um, thank you again, Craig, very much for a really interesting oh, my, talk. My pleasure. Thanks for indulging me. Yeah, a lot, a lot to think about. Um, yeah. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this will be posted on, on YouTube and we'll send the link around when it's up. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was a great, great talk.